Now that we've introduced the idea of functions, uh, particularly the definition that a function is a relation in which every input corresponds to exactly one output, we're going to look at the graphs of these things. Um, so what I have up here is a graph um, of a relation, we'll call it a relation for a moment. Um, and then what I want to do is figure out whether this graph represents a function or not. Okay, well, the definition of a function, like I said, is a relation in which every input corresponds to exactly one output. Okay, every x value has exactly one uh, y value. Okay, well, if I look at this graph, <coughs> to determine that, I cannot have an x value correspond to more than one y value. Okay, so I cannot have any x value have more than one y value associated with it. Well, if I take an x value uh, like 8, there's one y value, 6, that corresponds to it uh, right here. Um, there isn't a second one, right? And so there's no other point vertically from that one. Uh, for instance, the number 3, negative 3. If I plug in negative 3, remember the x's are the inputs, the y's are the outputs. So if I plug in a negative 3, then the output, well, there, I don't know exactly what the output is, I don't have it written up here, but the output is, uh, there's just one of them, right? Uh, there's not a second one. <clears throat> and so if you had two points that lined up vertically on the graph, then they would be two different y values that would correspond to the same x value. Okay, so if, if I had two points lined up vertically at, uh, at an x value of two, then those would be two different y values, okay? Two different outputs that would correspond to the same input. We don't have that anywhere on this graph. And a quick check for that is to, is to take a bunch of vertical lines, in fact, an infinite number of them, and run them along the graph. And as long as the graph intersects each of those vertical lines once, or maybe none at all, but at most once, then you have a function. If you ever had a vertical line that hit the graph twice, it would no longer be a function because those two points of intersection would then be two outputs for the same input. The vertical line represents a single output, or I'm sorry, a single input, and then every point on that vertical line would represent the output. But if there's two, there'd be two outputs. So we only want one intersection. We call this the vertical line test, okay? So the vertical line test is where we check the graph and as long as every possible vertical line hits it once or zero times, uh, then you have a function. And that's the case for this one. So I have a series of questions up here, um, things that we can find out about this graph. I'm going to call this graph f of x because it is a function, um, as we just discovered. And my first question is along those lines. It says, does the graph represent a function? Why or why not? So the answer to that, as I just mentioned, is yes, it is a function, and it's because it passes the vertical line test. That's one way that you could describe it. Um, so I would say yes, uh, because it passes the vertical line test. And I'm just going to abbreviate vertical line test VLT for right now. Okay, Save a little space. Um, you could also say something about for every input there's exactly one output or, or you never have two outputs for the same input or something like that. There's other ways to describe that, but to me the simplest way is it passes the vertical line test. Okay, um, Okay. so now, now that we've established it is a function, let's look at some function values uh, like f of 2 and f of 4. Okay, What does that mean? Well when you see this notation f of 2, that means the 2 is the input because it's in the parentheses, so that's your x value. So you want to go along the x-axis until you see a 2, okay, 2 is on the x-axis, and then you go to the output, f of 2 is the output, 2 is the input, f of 2 is the output. And so you want here, oh, my green marker's dying on me, um, Got another one. That one's kind of dying on me. Okay, well, f of 2 is going to be negative 3. Okay? 
right, f of 2 is negative 3 because negative 3 is the output that corresponds to the input of negative 2. Uh, f of 4 is the output that corresponds to an input of 4. So if I go over to 4, go down to the graph, the output is negative 2. All right, so that's going to be the output that corresponds to an input of 4. All right, so again, the, if the number is in the parentheses, that represents the input of, of x. And when you're looking for f of 4, that means you're looking for the output that corresponds to the input of 4. Okay. I'll switch up markers here. Get a better color going. Um, okay. Find x such that f of x is equal to 4. So here, my expression, the x, the input is unknown. So we're looking for an x value, right? It says find x. So we're looking for an x. And then it says here that the output is 4. f of x is equal to 4. So I'm looking for an output of 4. That's a y value. So I go along the y axis till I hit 4. That's up here. And then I look for uh, the, the x values that make that work. Well, there's one over here on the left. This point, uh, negative 2.5 comma 4, is on the graph. So that's the first one x equals negative 2.5 because negative 2.5 comma 4 is on the graph but there's a second one right at 4 you could also come over to the right here and there's also a point now I don't have the point designated on the graph so we're gonna have to estimate where that's at okay so if I came over to 4 or came up to 4 and over to the graph and then down we're hitting oops and draw that very straight and draw that very straight. We're hitting right around five and a half. It's somewhere between five and six. Now, because I don't have a specific value designated, I'm just gonna estimate that to be about five and a half. So I'm gonna say X is approximately 5.5, okay? Now, on some of these, uh, if the graph isn't super clear, we're just gonna use an approximate. Okay, we're going to estimate where that's at. Um, but at other points where the point is very clearly uh, stated on the graph, then you can use an exact value. All right? uh, so that will work. Um, next question, is f of 1 positive or negative? Okay, so how do you determine that? Well, first of all, we're looking to see if the function value is positive or negative. That's the y value when x is 1. So if x is 1, 1 is the input. You go to one on the graph on the x-axis and then go to the graph. And here we have to go down to get to the graph. That means the graph, the function value, is in the negative. Okay, anything below the x-axis would be a negative function value. And anything above the x-axis would be a positive function value. Okay? The function value, remember, is the y value. And so if it says is f of x is f of one positive or negative. Well, here you go to 1, you go down to get to the graph. That means it's a negative function value or a negative y value. So we would say negative on that one. Okay, I'll just circle it. Um, another question. For what values of x is f of x greater than 0? Okay, well, here we're saying the outputs, f of x, must be greater than 0. And we're looking for the inputs that make that happen. Well, let's just look at the graph for a moment. Where are the... Uh, outputs greater than zero or positive. Well, anywhere that the graph is above the x-axis. Okay, so my graph is above the x-axis on the left here, all the way up to neg uh, up to negative one. And of course, we're looking for the x values, right? For what values of x? So we're looking for x values that make the graph positive. I'm going to assume that this graph has what we call an asymptote, which means that um, the graph approaches the x-axis but doesn't cross it later on, okay? Um, and I drew it kind of that way, although you can't see further on. Um, I'm going to make that assumption right now, which means this graph is positive all the way to negative infinity on the left. Uh, also, it's positive all the way over to negative 1 on the right. So the first interval for what values of x is f of x positive greater than 0, I'm going to write in from negative infinity up to that value of negative 1. Now, as an interval, I need to either include or exclude the endpoint. 
and on the negative 1, I'm going to choose to exclude it. The reason I'm going to exclude negative 1 is because the graph is not positive at negative 1. It is 0 at negative 1. Okay, so I don't want to include that endpoint. Um, I also cannot include the endpoint of negative infinity because it's not really an endpoint. It's not really on the number line. Okay, uh, we never actually achieve negative infinity. So neither endpoint is going to be included on this interval. Um, there is a second interval, right? The graph dips down below the x-axis and then comes back above. And so there's another group of x values or interval on the right uh, that corresponds to positive function values. And that's from 5 to infinity. You can see the x-intercept there is at 5. Or hopefully you can see that, might be a little small. Uh, but that's the number 5 right there. So from 5 to infinity, you have another um, group of x values that make the function value positive. Again, I can't include the infinity, because it's not really a number on the number line. And I can't include the 5, because at 5, the function is 0. It's equal to 0. Okay, We don't want it equal, we want it greater than. Um, now, we may have talked about this in a previous video, but um, when you're combining two intervals like this in the same set, you put a union symbol between them. And the union symbol, a U, um, means that you're including both of those sets, the union of the two sets. Okay, um, now let's look at the next question. It says, what are the domain and range of f of x? Well, remember the domain is the set of all the inputs or the independent variables, okay? So in our case, that's the x, val <coughs> excuse me, the x values. So the domain is all the values of x that correspond to points on the graph. Well, this graph covers every value of x. It covers the entire horizontal number line. Notice this arrow here goes left. When the arrow is pointing left like this with no obvious um, cutoff or boundary, we say that it goes to negative infinity. It keeps going to the left indefinitely. Same thing to the right. This arrow goes to the right. Um, we're going to say that it also um, goes on indefinitely. Uh, and so the domain of this is going to be all real numbers. And we've talked about multiple different notations for the set of all real numbers. I'm going to use the interval from negative infinity to infinity. Um, the range is a little bit trickier with this because I have to make a couple of assumptions. And those assumptions are the asymptote on the left here, which I already mentioned. Asymptote just means you get closer to the line without crossing it. And I'm going to assume that this also has an asymptote up here, um, you know, somewhere around four. Oops, somewhere around a height of four. Okay, I don't know exactly because I didn't put it on the graph, but somewhere up there. And so the range, remember, is a set of all outputs for this graph, a set of all y values. And so the range then is going to be every y value that corresponds to a point on the graph. Well, notice if you go below negative 3, there are no points in the graph down here. If you go above 6, there are no points in the graph above 6. So every point on the graph is pinned between negative 3 and 6, right? This whole graph is in that region. Um, in addition to that, every point in that range is hit by the graph, right? There's no gaps in here. Um, and so I have one single interval. It goes from negative 3 to 6. So I'm going to write those two numbers down, negative 3 and 6. Those are my endpoints. Now I have to determine whether I'm going to include them or exclude them. The negative 3, well, I'm going to include the negative 3 because it's a point on the graph. It actually corresponds to a value that's on the graph. So I'm going to include that one with a bracket. The 6 also is a point on the graph. There is a point 6 units high. And so I'm going to include that one also with a bracket. Okay. okay, next question. How many times does the line y equal 1 half intersect the graph? Well, y equals 1 half is a horizontal line. Okay, 
Uh, if you have y equals a number, that's always a horizontal line. x equals a number is always a vertical line. This one is a line half a unit high. And basically, when you have y equals a number, that just means all of the y values for the points are that number. So it's a fixed constant height of one half. Now, how many times does that hit the graph? Well, if you come up one half and go across, you're going to hit the graph once in this area and once over here and also once over here. So you really have three different intersections for that line. Okay, If I were to draw a line, which I'm not going to do because it's going to mess my graph up, but if I draw the line through there, it's going to intersect the graph three times. Okay, So how many times does it intersect the graph? Uh, let's say three times. Okay. Okay, next question, what are the x-intercepts? Okay, so the x-intercepts are the places where the graph hits the x-axis, okay, specifically goes through the x-axis or touches it. Um, there are two of them, right? There's one here at negative one and one over here at five. Um, I don't have an x-intercept on the left because I'm claiming that this is an asymptote and it's not going to hit that. Um, it's not going to hit that line. It's just going to run next to it kind of. Um, and then I'm claiming there's no intercept of over to the right either because that sort of flattens out. And so uh, the two x-intercepts are going to be um, negative 1, 0 and 5, 0. Remember, x-intercepts always have a y value of 0, an output of 0. That's how they get on the x-axis. Uh, then a y-intercept. Well, what is the y-intercept? y-intercept is where the graph crosses the y-axis, and here we have one at negative 2. Okay, so that would mean the ordered pair that corresponds to the y-intercept is 0, because that's the horizontal value, comma, negative 2. Okay, so there's our y-intercept. Um, now, there cannot be more than one y-intercept, right? There can only be one. If there's more than one y-intercept, then this graph would have failed the vertical line test because the y-axis would have had two points. It's a vertical line that would have had two points on it. And so there can only be one y-intercept. Now, some functions won't have any, uh, but you definitely cannot have more than one y-intercept. X-intercepts, you can. You can have more than one x-intercept. The graph can cross the x-axis. Uh, a graph of a function can cross the x-axis any number of times. Um, here we have two, but it could be more than that. It doesn't matter. Um, but for the y-intercept, you can only have one or potentially zero if it doesn't hit the axis at all. Okay. Um, so these are just some features of, um, of a graph that we're going to be looking at uh, throughout the semester. And we'll see this, all of these types of features um, for many different types of graphs. Um, but this is a, a good... Uh, sampling of the types of questions you could be asked to identify on a graph.